Hello, everyone, and welcome to this edition of our 7 Investing Podcast, where it's our mission to empower you to invest in your future. You can learn more about our long-term investing approach at 7investing.com slash subscribe. My name is Simon Erickson. Today, we're going to be talking about dividends. You've got to love dividends. There's some feeling of safety you get from having a quarterly check deposited directly into your brokerage account. And who better to talk to about dividends than the grand pooba of income investing himself, James Early. James is the chief investment officer at BBAE. He's also formerly the CEO of Stansbury China and also advisor of Motley Fool's Income Investor Service. James, also a close friend of mine for about 15 years or so now. It's so exciting for me to have you on the 7 Investing Podcast today. Simon, I'm just as excited. Yeah, it's been a while since we've chatted. Uh, That's a very flattering intro. Happy to chat about dividends. They have good aspects, bad aspects. I I was lucky to to run a dividend newsletter service for for 10 years and lucky enough to beat the market during those 10 years. But uh, people say, what's my secret? I really don't have anything. It's just dividends are statistically likely to beat the market. So if you're going to be picking any kind of stocks blindly, I'd say let those stocks be dividend stocks. Can, can Can you walk us through the background, James? What got you into income investing? What got you interested in dividends in the first place? You know, it, it was kind of random. They, they needed a guy to run a dividend service. And, and, and so th- there was not, uh, you know, th- there's not a dramatic backstory. But, but I am a data guy. So I mean, I, I look at the numbers. I'm not so much an emotional investor, which is probably good investing. It's bad in the rest of my life because I'm this like, you know, unemotional automaton sometimes. But, but with, with investing, it, it's useful. And there's so much data supporting dividend stocks, supporting the outperformance of dividend stocks that, that I, I took to it like a, a fish to water. Uh, you know, over and over and over again, studies show dividend stocks outperform. Not all the time. I want to be clear. There are definitely periods of time, including right now, Simon, including right now, where dividend stocks don't outperform. I just looking moments before we, speak, we spoke, and the S&P 500 is up 9.4% year to date. The DVY, which is the iShares uh, Select Dividend Index, something like that, it's an ETF, is down 9, 9.4%. So almost, so literally, exactly 100% inversely correlated uh, for the moment, not always. So, so it is not, it has, has not been a good time so far this year for dividend stocks, but, but that may change, Simon. So let's do a quick refresher for a lot of people that are listening to the program or listen to our podcast. This might already be familiar to them, but uh, for some of that might not, you know, dividends is a capital allocation decision that companies can pursue, right? They have money that's available uh, that they want to share with their investors and their shareholders. They pay out a cash dividend that it's up to the investor on what they want to do with it. You can take it out as cash, you can reinvest it to buy more shares, other things like this. But in, uh, in looking at dividend paying companies, James, if you're looking at kind of the bigger picture of how they're structured or how they're paying things out, what are a couple of factors that investors should be looking at before they take the, uh, the, you know, the leap of faith and actually invest money in a dividend paying company? Well, great question. And let me just back up to what we just said. So, so there, there is a paper, and I'm forgetting the exact name, but it's by Rob Arnott and Cliff Asnes, so something called like surprise, higher, uh, higher dividends equals higher earnings growth. Uh, and it basically, I mean, there's a stereotype with dividend paying stocks that by the time a company gets so old and gray and has expanded all its growth opportunities, that finally it starts paying a dividend. And, and that's sometimes true. But there is massive, massive waste in, in U.S. corporate, corporate America, probably corporate world, uh, and, and dividends can enforce a certain discipline that, that companies say, okay, well, should I, should I expand in this kind of a tenuous new area that I'm not so good at, or should I just pay a dividend? And so dividends have a way of enforcing uh, companies to have a good capital allocation policy, and it's a way of sort of self-selecting responsible companies. So that's an argument for this paper that I just mentioned about why higher paying stocks often have higher earnings growth and often do better is it's not the fact that they're giving away money so much as that it signals uh, a sort of a corporate responsibility. So back to your question, what, what factors do I look for? I look for what I call the three M's, management, moat, and money situation management. And, and by the way, this is my, these are my dividend factors. If you said, what are your, your biotech factors, your AI stock factors, I might have different factors, but for dividend stocks, these are my factors. So management is, is, you know, you want people with tenure in the business, ideally with, with skin in the game, especially if it's a small company, if it's a big, huge company that's been around forever, you're not going to have management that owns like a huge percent usually. Uh, but you want them to have some meaningful percent of the equity. Uh, you know, I typically Google their backgrounds, uh, look at the proxy statements, see how they're paid. Uh, are, are they paid by stock price gains, which is kind of a no, no, or are they paid by growing return on invested capital, which is sort of like the je ne sais quoi, kind of like the, not je ne sais quoi, kind of the, 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 the key point of a business, basically, is to earn more on its capital than its capital providers are expecting. So management is key. Moat, 
moat is where you would compare ROIC to, let's say, weighted average cost of capital. In other words, you know, if I borrow money from a bank at 8% and I go invest that money in the stock market, I better earn at least 8%, right? A business works kind of the same way, but they're, they're doing more than just borrow money. They're also taking on money from equity providers and investing it, and they'd better earn at least that expected return, which is called the weighted average cost of capital. If your you know, debt investors expect 8% and your equity investors expect 9% and your 50-50 debt equity, roughly speaking, your weighted average cost of capital is 9%. So companies that have a moat, a sustainable, enduring business advantage, whether that's a brand, whether that's a regulatory moat, like a pipeline, you can't just build a pipeline right next to another pipeline unless you really, really, really demonstrated an economic need. Companies that have that moat have an advantage. You know, in general, in general, when we model companies, we tend to assume a reversion to the mean because that's what happens with most companies. They start out, it's a great flash in the pan, then after five years, 10 years, 15 years, you know, the competition has eroded that edge. But there are some companies, Simon, like maybe Walmart or like Amazon or, or Disney, they just kind of keep going along and keep earning above average returns just perpetually. They have a moat. And finally, money situation is what it sounds like it is. Just can the company pay its dividend? In my early risky dumb years, you know, I, I once or twice I fell for di companies that were paying dividends by virtue of taking on debt, paying dividends they couldn't really afford to pay because they wanted to be in the check the box category of dividend stocks. Because at the time, dividend stocks were sexy. You know, don't don't do that. Don't be you know young James early. You you want to be mature about this. Make sure their their, their coverage is okay. They can pay the dividend. The cash flows are healthy. I don't really worry about bankruptcy so much with most dividend stocks. I mean, it's more like, can they pay their dividend? If I'm looking at startup company, then, you know, bankruptcy may be more of an issue, but it's just more, can they comfortably pay the dividend? So that's a very long answer to a very short question, but management, moat, and money situation. So those are perfect, James. Those are, I love the three M's. That's a perfect des description of what to look for. Maybe we tie them all together and we kind of um, double click on this relationship that the dividend ties the company's management to the investors themselves with, right? If you're initiating a dividend, a, long time, a lot of times it's a long-term commitment, right? Like you said, you have to have a responsibility to kind of pay that out. You might have institutions that have got, you know, retirement funds counting on that dividend. Uh, how, how do you think about dividends and should, should a dividend be something that is just continually paid and then increased 10% every year? Or we certainly some, sometimes see companies do variable dividends, or is this just something that's company specific? How do you think about the nature of a, of a dividend, um, you know, continuing over time and sustainability of that dividend? That is a deeply philosophical question, Simon. Actually, I'm glad you asked it. You know, originally, originally dividends were like ultra fixed, and they still mostly are in the U.S. It's a terrible signal to cut one's dividend. Unless everybody else is cutting it, then it's like okay. But but generally, you don't want to cut it because dividends. I mean, stocks originally were essentially competing with bonds. And so the dividend was sort of like the, the bondish aspect of a stock. And they wanted to never cut it like a bond, you know, bonds are, are legally required to pay a certain coupon payment, right? Now in Europe and in, in some parts of Asia, dividends tend to be more flexible. They're paid out as a percentage of earnings. Now, when, when I was a pure ideologue, I loved the fixed dividend because it was Disciplined. It's what dividend stocks should do, uh, and and I'm, I'm probably going to offend some people who are pure ideologues or who just really want that fixed payment. But I would argue, I would argue that it's actually much healthier for a company to have a flexible dividend pay payout ratio or payment because they could they could adjust it. If they're making a lot of money, they pay more. If not, they 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 don't. I mean, from time to time, companies pay a special dividend. Yes, but that's like super rare. Uh, it's just typically like a one-time windfall. It's not, not like a big thing in the U.S. So I'm in favor. I'm in favor of a flexible adjusting dividend policy that scales up and down with company health and that does not signal the end of the world if a dividend is lowered. Uh, I think that would be healthier for companies. You wouldn't see people struggling and, and companies struggling and borrowing money sometimes to pay their dividend. In this case, not to look like a sexy dividend payer, but just because they're so scared of what happens if they cut their dividend. So, so I'm, I'm in favor of flexible policy. James, can we talk about that, though, the dividend cut? It's the worst case scenario, right? Nobody wants to be in the headline that you cut the dividend, but sometimes we see it. We saw Intel just earlier this year. Intel's paid dividends for so many years and finally said, you know, we really need to put our capital elsewhere. We're going to cut the dividend. A lot of people, of course, certainly hate to see the dividend cut. Uh, what is your take on it? Is that responsible management or is that something that's just a, a huge red flag for you as an investor? Well, I mean, look, it's obviously bad. And, and a lot of the people who, who bought the stock for the dividend are, are going to bail, okay? And it's going to be a negative catalyst for the stock price. In, in the case of an Intel, I mean, that's, 
probably on the better end of the dividend cut spectrum. You know, a lot of times you'll have companies paying, by, by the way, a huge, huge yield is usually a warning sign. If you're just coming in dividends and you say, hey, I'm going to search in you know, Yahoo or Finviz or some screener and just buy the highest dividend yielding stock. That's great. This one's paying 16% yield. Uh, just right off the bat, I get 16%. So, you know, any, any capital appreciation is gravy. Don't think like that. Okay. Usually, usually that very high dividend yield is a sign that's looking backwards. It's saying last year's dividend compared to today's stock price equates to a 16% yield. It does not mean, it, and almost it's very unlikely that you're going to get 16% yield going forward. So really high yields are red flags for a cut. Um, those are stocks best to avoid. If it's a really good honest, legitimate company that you like the prospects and they're just having a difficult financial time for, for a year or a few years and they have to cut the dividend, that's, that's healthy. You know, that's a sign of, you know, just like it's good to be able to admit your weaknesses, right? And, and talk through them as, as a human, same thing for a company. So I, I would welcome that as a sign of financial maturity. I mean, obviously it's not good, but you know, if, if you're relying on the dividend cut to signal financial trouble, like you're not doing your homework, you, you know, those, those signs should be, uh, uh, you know, portrayed or, or, or shown across a number of different aspects of a company's finances. So it should not be a big surprise. Uh, and if you like the company for the long run, continue to hold. And where is the sweet spot for dividend investing, James? You know, you, you were talking about kind of using a screener where you might go out and you might want to look for the highest yield up front, right? You're getting the most cash today, but then there's also risk of them cutting or reducing that later on. Versus another company that might have a lower yield, a lower upfront payment that they're increasing steadily over time. Is there a certain dividend yield you're looking for to at least put some money in your bank every quarter, but then also a growth metric associated with that too? Yeah, it's a great question. So, so I'll split it into two parts. When I was running Motley Fool Income Investor, I generally looked for you know, about a 25 3% minimum yield because it has to be enough of a dividend for someone buying a dividend product to actually get a dividend. You know, 0.5% yield is just not a meaningful dividend, even if it's technically a dividend. Now, now what should people do? P pretending you know, that's not a constraint and pretending you don't want 16% yield. I'm going to turn to a graphic from the Financial Times. The data is from Ned Davis Research and I believe Hartford Funds, starting with $100 in 1973, which is not long after the U.S. abandoned the gold standard until the end of 2021. $100 put into uh, dividend, just plain old dividend payers grows to $8,842, which is wonderfully nice, uh, quite a bit higher than just the plain old S&P 500, but put into companies that are raising or initiating dividend payments, it grows to $14,405. So unless you absolutely like need that high payout, I would say go for the dividend raisers and, and growers and initiators versus just, just a plain high yield because you're going to get more on the capital gain side. And one other question related to this, James, is we've seen some, some kind of unique business models uh, arise to take advantage of higher dividend payouts, right? Some of these are natural as part of the industry they serve. Some are just getting a little more creative. One of the more natural fits for the industry is things like pipelines, right? We see midstream pipelines, these kind of massive limited partnerships are paying out very high dividends. Uh, there are also tax advantage companies, things like REITs, real estate investment trusts that often pay very, very high dividends because they're required to by the way that the company is formed. But then we've also seen some capital management companies, some other creative um, you know, formations of businesses because they want to pay out as high of a yield as possible. Any thoughts on those kind of unique structures, James? Are those good for investors to consider or a little bit too sexy and creative and not really good? It depends on the investor. Yeah, I certainly recommended some of them in my newsletter, you know, business development companies, uh, REITs, MLPs. These are basically all using structures blessed by Congress because they thought the U.S. needed more of something. In the case of business development companies, BDCs, it was more middle market lending. You know, their company, a lot of companies were a little bit too big to go to the local bank but a little bit too small to go to capital markets to raise financing. So there's kind of this underserved middle market. They said, okay, it's a pass-through thing. You don't pay tax on the entity level. You pay out huge yields, uh, and, and supposedly everybody wins. Similar with REITs, uh, similar with master limited partnerships. You know, we didn't have enough in the U.S. We didn't have enough midstream uh, energy infrastructure. We needed more pipelines. So uh, Congress essentially blessed this act, which, which allowed MLPs, and, and it was abused for a while, then they, they kind of pulled it back to – to just pipelines. I mean, we had, you know, Cedar Fair Amusement Park getting in and his MLP, which is kind of not really the spirit of the law. Um, but, but, you know, uh, there's nothing inherently wrong with them. Uh, they, they come and go. I mean, there, there are fads like everything else where suddenly, you know, BDCs are all the rage. Suddenly, REITs are all the rage. Your MLPs are all the rage. Uh, and then they're not. And, and they can be 
vulnerable to sudden, even tiny changes in the law. And they definitely have tax consequences in terms of should you hold them in an IRA or not. And sometimes these are debated. So, you know, yes, I would, you know, I would not shy away from them, but they tend to be a little better for probably the higher net worth investors who, who have their own tax advisor who's okay to help them you know, work through some of the, the stuff. I wouldn't come in as a brand new investor and, and get into that just because it's probably a little bit more uh, homework than, than you want at that stage. Yeah, perfect. So, so let's frame all these last 20 minutes or so, James, of context, and let's bring it to today of where we stand right, as investors. Because at 7 Investing, you know, we, we kind of offer the full buffet of options every month. We offer some high risk, kind of riskier, you know, higher return, higher risk, higher reward companies, but then we also have some lower risk uh, companies on the scorecard as well. I'm getting a lot of questions from our members lately about income producing companies. You know, they don't like the volatility, they didn't like 2022, didn't like the ups and downs in the market. And they say, you know, what are some of your lower risk income paying ideas? And I would like to ask that question to you too, James. It's like, you know, in the market that we're in right now, rates are going up, it's getting more expensive for companies to borrow. Uh, where do dividend paying companies stand? Is this a more attractive time? To invest in dividend companies, or is, or is should you go for you know a higher risk company uh, now that the market's kind of lower? Uh, you know, it's a great question. If I completely knew the answer, I, I would be on some beach somewhere, Simon. But <laughs> I think right now, you know, it, it's easy, it's tempting to look backwards as an investor, but we need to be looking forwards. We've come from a rising, the fastest rising rate environment we've ever had, literally in, in, in the U.S. Right? If I'm not mistaken, uh, which is just brutal to you know Silicon Valley Bank and and, and other other companies taking interest rate risk. Uh, and that's been, been brutal to dividend stocks, to a lot of different companies. However, we're nearing probably at a rate plateau environment right now. And, and probably by the end of the year, maybe early next year, something like that, we may well have a declining rate environment. And that's important to, to consider because we invest not for the past, but for the future. So in other words, dividend stocks have taken a beating. I think DVY yields or recently yield like four, four and a half percent. I mean, that's come on. That's amazing, right? So it, it was, was a horrible time to buy dividend stocks recently, but it, I think personally, just my own personal view is it's getting to be a lot better time to look at dividend stocks as those interest rates start to plateau and, and, and possibly go down. And, and before we talk about some of the individual companies that I know that you like, James, are there certain sectors that you really like to invest in for dividend paying companies? I know that banks pay dividends, some tech companies pay dividends, retailers. Back to the thing that you mentioned about management and kind of the moat that, that companies have. Are there certain sectors of the market that are more um, able to afford to continue to pay dividends over time? Yeah, you know, MLPs, we mentioned, I mean, they're complicated, but they do have, they have probably the best moats uh, in, in terms of protected business positions. I mean, b banks, banks traditionally have been good dividend payers, you know, there's up and down with banks and there's, there, you know, they've got interest rate risk. And so maybe I'm, I might be bottom fishing on some small to mid-sized banks now, but, but it wouldn't be for dividend reasons. In other words, if I'm buying a bank now, it would not be for, for a dividend reason. Uh, pharma is, is a perennial dividend payer. I, I, I've, I've loved to hate pharma for the longest time as an investment because I was so worried that, you know, the chemical-based uh, kind of small molecule drug discovery uh, process had really hit diminishing returns. But, you know, there's still a lot coming up from biotech, and a lot of biotechs are really for sale on the cheap now. So it, it may be, you know, and pharma had kind of a, a save the world boom during COVID and, and now has come back down to earth a little bit. So uh, pharma to me is looking a little bit more attractive. And then just general, I mean, tech companies, tech hated dividend stocks for the longest time, because if you were a tech company and, and you started paying a dividend, it was like checking into the retirement home, the hospice even like you, your, your days were your best days were behind you. That stigma is now long gone, you know, probably 10 years out of date now. So we've got a lot of mature tech companies that have strong business models, have, have strong gross margins and are starting to pay dividends. So, you know, that's probably another sector I take a look at. And how about two or three companies, James, that, you know, with all the years of dividend investing that you've done, what are two or three companies that you like, you really like to invest in, dividend payers? Well, Simon, your, your readers seem to be wanting kind of lower risk dividend stocks, and that's where I'll go with, with these two companies. In fact, I'll go to the U.K. I mean, they, they trade in the U.S., but they're, they're uh, headquartered in the U.K. Uh, because U, U.K. has had a rough time lately, but these are, I think that's making the prices attractive for these otherwise good companies. One is Diageo. It's got a 2% yield. DEO is the ticker here. And by the way, this is a company that I like. Uh, I'm not telling anyone to buy it or not buy it. It's not a formal recommendation one way or another. Just I like it. It's a no thesis company. No thesis stocks are my favorite dividend stocks. That means nothing particular has to happen for this company to do well. It just has to keep doing what it's always been doing. 
There's no like, you know, regulatory approval, no, you know, phase three trial results. There's no like particular catalyst. This company makes branded stuff and it charges a lot of money for it. Uh, the alcohol sales in worldwide are growing faster than GDP. Uh, the, the hard liquor uh, a lot of times takes 15 years to age. So, you know, Simon and James can't just start up Simon and James Distillery and immediately compete with Diageo, right? We, we're, we're 15 years behind. So it takes a long time to compete with this company. Humans will always want a signal status. Uh, Diageo is super premium stuff. Their, their segment is, I want to say, growing more than 25% a year in terms of revenue growth. Phenomenal. ROIC is in the mid-teens and operating profits are supposed to grow 6% to 9% per year through 2025. So nothing fancy or flashy about Diageo. But I think it is on the right side of a global growth trend. Uh, that, that is number one, Diageo. Number two is Unilever, even more boring. This is a, a boring, fast-moving consumer products company. They make Vaseline, uh, Dove soap, Q-tips, Hellman's mayonnaise. I, I never like mayonnaise. I don't know why. The Hellman's mayonnaise, uh, Axe body spray. And I'm, I'm presuming you're not a heavy user of Axe body spray, uh, Simon, because I'm about to insult it. But it's just, you know, you, you know, you get on the subway with these teens, you know, just, they just douse themselves. So anyway, I don't like the product. But, but I love the company. Love the company. Uh, th these guys have over 400 brands. They're in 190 of the 195 company, co countries worldwide. That's, that's a lot. 58% of sales are to emerging markets where brands matter and often people pay a little bit more you know, to get the, the real brand versus kind of the, the, the local brand they might not trust as much. Uh, beauty, 42% of revenues. I'm, I'm thinking the Food is 38%, and then uh, home care, just cleaning stuff, is 20%. The catalyst here, you think, what's the stock's kind of treaded water forever? Activist investor named Nelson Peltz joined the board, and the CEO is, is going to be a former CEO as of the end of this year. They tried to acquire uh, GSK's uh, consumer products division. That didn't go well. He's going to quit. We'll have new blood. Uh, Procter & Gamble was in a similar situation some years ago, and with new management, they really took off. So this could be uh, – this, this, this time right now, 2023, could be Unilever's Procter & Gamble moment. And talk to me, uh, great, great ideas there, James. Diageo is DEO, about a 2% dividend yield today. Unilever is UL, 3.5% dividend yield. Do you collect the dividends and, and take them all as cash and then reinvest them into one company that you really like? Or you just let them compound over years and years? What's, it, what's the idea for dividends over a long term? Yeah, it's a great, super good question. It depends on the account you're holding them in. Yeah, you can, you can just automatically reinvest them in the companies that paid them. You can just take the cash and spend it, or you can take them and then put them into, you know, whatever is the most deserving. And that's, that's usually what, what I do. Now, sometimes I get lazy about it, but, 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 you know, it's, it's usually best to take them and, and reallocate, especially if that's in a, in a tax advantage account. Or I do it in a tax advantage account. So, but, but you got those choices and, you know, maybe when I'm 65, then I'll switch to just taking that money and spending it. Yeah, fantastic, James. And then just one thing as we're closing out here, BBAE is a brokerage account, right? Or that's, can you tell us a little bit about this and where we can learn more about BBAE? Yeah, easy. Just BBAE.com, just BBAE.com, very easy. It's a, a discount broker. You can use your app. Uh, no commission. We have stocks. We have options. We have research. Uh, you know, we've set it up so you can tailor your use depending on how much, how much guidance or how much control you want. If you want to just buy stocks with some supporting research, you can do that. If you want to look at some investing themes, get some, some uh, more robust ideas or, or clusters of ideas, we can do that. Or if you just want something that's managed, we can also do that. Well, thanks very much once again, James Early, the Chief Investment Officer of BBAE. Also a wealth of knowledge about dividend investing. James, really appreciate you being on the show here today. It's my pleasure, Simon, as always. And thanks, everybody, for tuning in to this edition of our 7 Investing podcast. We are here to empower you to invest in your future. We are 7 Investing.